Hello everyone, welcome to our group. Uh, first, keep in mind of Zani. If you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation or after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming dear Professor Seven Model, the Professor of Management Accounting at Allianz Man Manchester Business School. He received his PhD in Business Administration from Lund University. He currently serves the editorial of a Journal of Management uh, Accounting uh, Research and uh, Associate Editor of Accounting and Business Research and the, and the sits of the, the editorial board of a number of other leading accounting journals. In, in addition, he is an editor uh, of the European Accounting Association PhD uh, Ministering Initiative he is he serves as international director and the chair of the international committee association management science management accounting session and uh, was also a member of the executive committee of this uh, session uh, he is president uh, of several research award his research has been published in top ranking journals in accounting now we will start our seminar with dear Professor Seven Modi. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Any problems? Hopefully not. Good. Um, yes, yes, we can hear you. All right. <laughs> Great. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Uh, thanks for this uh, very kind invitation to present in your um, seminar series. Um, I realize that I follow in a long series of illustrious accounting scholars uh, presenting. So I feel very honored to get this opportunity to uh, present a paper of ours, which um, uh, which we've been working on for the past year or so. Um, so I should say just for the um, in, for the sake of housekeeping, uh, Mohammed and I agreed that well, in principle, I'm happy to take questions at any point in time during the presentation, but uh, we thought it would be best perhaps if I talk for about maybe 10 or 15 minutes first um, to outline the purpose of the paper and the uh, theoretical framework that we're using, and then maybe pause um, um, and make sure to make sure that everyone is on board, um, because I will dive straight into institutional theory. I'm not sure how familiar um, all of you are with with institutional theory uh, in general and the particular problems in institutional theory that we are concerned with in this paper. So I thought I might talk a little bit about that first, the theoretical foundations of the paper, that is, uh, and then pause and take questions. And before I go into the main part of the paper, which is the lit which is the literature review, uh, and and talk through that. So hopefully everyone is happy with that. But as I said. Um, if there are questions along the way, just raise your hands, and I guess Mohammed will um, will will monitor it all. So this is paper which is co-authored with uh, two colleagues of mine at um, the Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen, where I'm also a visiting professor. Uh, in addition to my main job here in Manchester, um, so my author co-authors I don't think they're present today. It's a bit late in the day in Norway. Um, there are Anna Atrem, who's a PhD student at. Um, um, at NHH uh, and my co-author, my co-supervisor, Anita Madel, who's an associate professor at uh, NHH. Uh, and I should say that we probably see this paper as a little bit of an agenda setting paper. We're in the process of um, building a research program in, uh, in Bergen uh, around the work that we've been doing and also with all PhD students um, around social environmental accounting and adopting an institutional theory perspective or similar perspectives, uh, similar sociological perspective, perspectives, I should say, on this, uh, this issue of social environmental accounting. And what we're doing in this paper is to try to take a relatively critical look at what's been done uh, to date um, in this area, social environmental accounting research based on institutional theory, um, so there will be critical tone in the review, but we also try to be constructive here and point towards a way forward, uh, whereby we might be able to uh, address or resolve some of the uh, problematic issues that I'll be highlighting in the in the paper or in the presentation. So a little bit of background first, Let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah, here we go. Um, 
where do we start? Uh, why are we doing this in the first place? Um, well, as those of you who are familiar with the um, SEA literature, it's a very broad field of research, um, which has drawn on a range of uh, social and economic theories and management theories and applied a, number, a range of different methodologies, uh, both quantitative and qualitative research. And broadly speaking, I guess this area can be divided into a sort of positivist, functionalist strand of research, which we're not so concerned with in this paper, and a more um, interdisciplinary, um, often qualitative research tradition, which often aspires to be critical in some fashion. I will talk a little bit more later on about what we mean by critical research or critical accounting research and how we conceptualize that in this paper. But I'm signaling already here that we are concerned with um, building a critical uh, research agenda uh, around that, that speaks to the interdisciplinary accounting literature in particular. So um, this literature has, well, I suppose it sort of grew, emerged in late 80s, early 90s, and has grown into a very uh, large research, research, uh, research uh, field. Um, in the interdisciplinary area, and um, which has drawn, as I said, on a range of different um, um, theories. And what we have seen happening in recent years, over the last decade in particular, is, um, as in many other field, other parts of the accounting literature, that institutional theory has taken off in a big way and become, I would say, nearly one of the dominant theoretical perspective, pers perspectives guiding interdisciplinary SEA research. Um, However, there is a broader debate also that we're trying in the SA literature uh, that we're trying to engage with here uh, around theory and theorizing and the role of theories in um, furthering the SA project. And this has been widely debated over many years. Uh, key people in this area, like Brendan O'Dwyer, Jeff Runeman, Rob Gray, and others, have chipped in from time to time to try to reflect on the um, on the state of the art of the theoretical. Um, of the theoretical faults that have been uh, dominating this particular field of research. Uh, one paper that we um, are quite heavily inspired by, I should say, um, is the paper by Spence et al. in Critical Perspectives on Accounting from 2010. Um, Crawford Spence and his colleagues at that time, I would argue, threw in a little bit of a hand grenade in the um, SEA community uh, by saying, uh, by publishing this very polemic paper uh, called, uh, um, that essentially argued that um, the SEA literature, unfortunately, has had, a, although it has a critical potential and emerged out of a critical research tradition in accounting, has had a tendency to lose that critical or radical edge um, as a result of not really being entirely faithful to the theories, the political theories that, um, or social theories that were being used. And at that time, in 2010, the dominant theories in this field were legitimacy theory, stakeholder theory, and uh, various forms of political economy theory uh, rooted in various, uh, rooted in Marxism fundamentally. And they were worried and concerned about this fact that um, account SEA scholars tended to, if you like, domesticate theories with critical potential and take the radical seal or radical edge off the SEA project. And at the same time, they were at least, well, I wouldn't say that they were hinting, they were implying quite strongly, I think, that SEA researchers were lagging behind the theoretical development and jumping on intellectual, on intellectual theoretical bandwagons that have been rolling for some time in organization studies, uh, but um, not really keeping up with the cutting edge or the state of the art of theories that they were using. So what we're doing, uh, in this paper is, I wouldn't say that we are replicating Spence at all, but uh, we are doing something relatively similar. Uh, we are taking a similar critical look at uh, how SEA scholars have used institutional theory and asking ourselves whether something similar to what they observed with respect to, to other, theor other social theories that were dominant at that time, 10 years ago, um, has been happening to institutional theory as well. And we think this is particularly relevant because within institutional theory, generally, if you look at management and organization studies, there have been similar debates about whether institutional theory is critical or whether it can even be critical. 
And there's no consensus really on this matter. Uh, you have critical accounting, critical management scholars like Hugh Wilmot in particular, who is adamant about the idea that institutional theory cannot ever be critical because it lacks that. It's fundamentally conservative or perhaps even managerialist, the way it has evolved over time. But then there are other people like Jakob Locke and others, and perhaps even myself to some degree, when I've been writing about this particular topic in other contexts, who are a little bit more at least on the fence on this question. Uh, we don't, or at least agnostic about whether institutional theory can be critical or not, or should be critical or not. And I'll, as I said, I'll come back to what I mean by critical later on. So in this paper, we are not trying to close down this debate prematurely. We're asking a relatively open-ended question about whether institutional research on SEA uh, has been, um, how it has evolved over time, first of all, how it has evolved conceptually and theoretically, whether it has kept up with um, the general developments of institutional theory and management and organization studies, and thirdly, whether it has been, uh, in some fashion, critical or not. And also, uh, by implication, whether there is a, a, a conflict, some form of conflict, or between being theoretically ambitious and being critical, that's really also very much part of the analysis, as you will see later on when I go through my, uh, the, my theoretical framework. So before I get there, before I get to the analytical framework and the literature review, I have to say a few words about the development of institutional theory over time. Um, I'm not gonna say very much about it because I don't have time for that, but a um, little bit of introduction I think is, 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 um, is helpful. Um, and I should say for those of you who are interested in reading up a little bit more deeply on this, this particular, this part, this first part, um, builds very much on the paper that I had in uh, contemporary, accounting, contemporary accounting research last year, which reviewed um, the development of institutional research on management accounting. So it follows a similar structure and line of argument. So as we know, as most of you probably know, institutional theory emerged in the late 70s, um, early 80s, with the work of Mayer Rowan and Dimaggio Pau, very much as a reaction against functionalist approaches, such as contingency theory that were dominant in institution, in organizational theory at that time. Um, and the, the two key ideas that came out of that early stream of institutional theory were the ideas of the notions of institutionalism, morphism, and decoupling. In other words, the question that in early institutional theorists asked themselves was, why do organizations become relatively similar, at least organizations that operate within the same kind of societal sectors or institutional fields? Why do they become similar over time? That's this morphism argument. And also, why do these increasingly institutionalized practices often, uh, why are they often decoupled from the actual operation, uh, operate, operating core of organizations? Um, those two ideas were dominant up to the late 80s, mid 90s, perhaps even. What started to happen, though, uh, as a little bit of a counter reaction to, to that early stream of institutional research in the late 80s was that um, idea, notions of strategic agency and uh, institutional entrepreneurship in particular, started to be re-incorporated, uh, if you like, in institutional theory. Because at that time, uh, late 80s, with DiMaggio's piece in um, 1988 in particular, uh, institutional theories, uh, theory, in, according to many critics, had become a little bit too structuralist, a little bit too deterministic, a little bit too macro, if you like. Um, and as a result of that, the role of human agency tended to disappear and questions about power and politics and conflicting interests and so on um, disappeared out of sight. Um, however, um, moving on a little bit, that was um, the, the pendulum that led to pendulums, that development, if you like, led to pendulum swing that according to some people, some institutional theories went a little bit too far. And in some cases nearly led institutional theories to start smuggling notions of rational actorhood or rational choice back into institutional theory. Um, so what started to emerge in the mid nineties was this um, compromise, if you like, between these very structuralist early strands of institutional theory and the more actor-centric strands of theory of institutional uh, thought uh, that tended to converge around some notion of embedded agency, where the consensus in institutional theory increasingly became that yes, agents, human agents are important, but obviously they do, they do not um, operate in an institutional vacuum. They all, their agency is always conditioned by pre-existing institutions. And hence, it's important to understand how agents are embedded in different institutional environments or institutional fields, 
and how that leads to um, um, leads to um, processes of both change and stability to often interact in uh, in complex patterns. So that's very much where um, uh, where um, institutional theory stood, say around the millennium. And from that point of view, uh, from that point of time, this notion of embedded agency, which I think there is quite broadly based consensus around in institutional theory now these days, that that's important. That has to be center stage. Otherwise, it's not institutional. As I often say when I talk about this, I tend to summarize this by saying that if it ain't embedded, it ain't institutional. In other words, uh, that idea of embedded agency has to be there for analysis of human agency to be framed as to be consistent, if you like, with basic arguments in institutional theory. Otherwise, there's a tendency that we revert to some form of excessive determinism or excessive voluntarism, and that we don't really sort of uh, strike a balance between these two opposing positions, and that the pendul constant pendulum swing between those two extremes uh, continues. That idea of embedded agency has then been um, manifest, I would argue, in two, what are today I think, two dominant streams in the institutional research um, in literature, um, which, which um, pivot around the notions of institutional work and institutional logics. So the institutional work strand is the more actor-centric strand that looks more closely at agency, especially collective agency, not just individual agency, uh, but still, at least in principle, looks at that as an, as an institutionally embedded phenomenon. And on the, on the other hand, um, you have the institutional logic strand, which is a more structuralist strand, I would argue, uh, but that breaks with older notions of institutional isomorphism by arguing that within particular institutional fields, you can have many different, often conflicting or competing institutional logics that make fields heterogeneous rather than homogeneous, which was very much the argument coming out of the early literature around institutional isomorphism. And that this leads to practice variations within fields and also increasingly uh, in the literature, what has been emphasized is the notion of hybridization, that hybrids are being formed be between uh, institutional logics as they are being translated into organizational practices. But throughout this literature, what I'm arguing here is that there has to be for this to still be a, what I call in my car paper, uh, where I use Lakatos as the, as the kind of leading light, for this still to be a progressive research program, there has to be a notion of embedded agency as the fundamental conceptual bedrock, um, even if we're then trying to build on that foundation and develop institutional theory in different uh, directions conceptually. Um, and this goes hand, this goes very much back to this idea that, um, or observation, that uh, institutional throughout this long history, since the late 70s, institutional theory has been underpinned by a strong normal science uh, tradition. That is where institutional theorists are constantly begin are constantly engaging in theoretical puzzle solving to either extend or refine the theory. And according to some critics, this might have gone a little bit too far to the so to the extent gone so far now so that we're uh, really beginning to just reinvent the wheel, which is a critical debate that we're not really going into in this in this paper, which I talk more about in my paper in Carr. Uh, but we are, we sort of, we, we still accept this idea that there is, at least in principle, a strong normal science ideal um, that underpins the conceptual development of institutional theory. And this is important if we switch over then to talk about why institutional theory is critical or whether it can be critical or not. Because according to many critics, especially Wilmot uh, and others, uh, this normal science tradition has tended to squeeze out any kind of critical intent or critical potential in institutional theory, because the main reason, the main preoccupation of institutional theorists, arguably, has been to constantly extend and refine uh, and the theory and build a more and more elegant and comprehensive theoretical framework, rather than engaging critically with with practice and engaging with uh, burning society, burning critical issues of, of marginalization, disenfranchisement increasingly what is being referred to as grand challenges in the organizational studies literature. And what is, has got lost in particular in that striving to constantly refine, extend and refine theory are critical concerns with power. So 
discussions around discussions of power are absolutely sent or central to us to determine whether institutional theory uh, or can be critical or not, and whether the SEA literature building on institutional theory is critical or not. So there has to be some kind of critical engagement with power for that critical edge, if you like, to be there, or critical potential to be there. And if you look at the criticism of institutional theory over the years, um, people were arguing that, well, in the early stages where notions of isomorphism were being emphasized, yeah, then yes, there was some kind of concern with power, but it was very much implicit. Uh, even if Mayor Rowan were talking about things like coercive isomorphism and so on, they tended to um, downplay that in many cases in favor of culture and cognition. Uh, and that's where power got lost, according to people like Clegg and others. Um, but we should say that power has come back, I think, in institutional theory more recently, especially um, in the institutional, well, well, from the late 80s, when DiMaggio was starting to talk about institutional entrepreneurship and argue that pol politics and power needed to be brought back into institutional theory. And especially um, in the institutional work and maybe also to some extent in the institutional logics perspective, we think that there is um, perhaps more explicit concern with power. And the way we uh, conceptualize power in this paper um, builds on a paper by, well, a book chocolate by, Laos, by, uh, by Lawrence from 2008, which in turn is a synthesis of how power has been conceptualized in, in various other forms of, of social theory. So we talk here about two forms of power, episodic power and systemic power. So episodic power is the way we normally think about power. That is a power that is very deliberately exercised by some actor or agent with strategic intent uh, to pursue a particular political agenda. And where that power is then, where that agent is then trying to either influence or force other actors to conform to their, uh, to, to their interests and aspirations. Um, the other coin of this other side of the coin when we talk about power is what we call systemic power, which um, comes from various sociological strands, not least for coal, uh, and with the way that has been incorporated into institutional theory is by emphasizing that they're also, in addition to episodic power, there are also more tacit or unobtrusive forms of power that operate uh, without us always often being aware of it, or without being uh, without power being power being observable, if you like. So that systemic force is also very much um, very much obviously much more difficult to observe empirically and and perhaps also theorize. But we believe that um, both these sides of power, both the sort of strategic, deliberate, episodic forms of power and systemic or unobtrusive forms of power need to be there, um, need to be need to be recognized for that to be some kind of uh, critical uh, understanding of power. But this also obviously um, relates very much to um, different strands of institutional theory, have theory are arguably have emphasized these two forms of power more or less. The episodic forms of power, not surprisingly, perhaps come through more strongly in the actor-centric approaches to institutional theory, in institutional theory, like institutional entrepreneurship, institutional work, while the systemic forms of power come through more strongly, perhaps, in the structuralist strands, like especially when you talk about institutional logics. Although Thornton et al., who are key advocates of the institutional logics perspective, even admit themselves in the book from 2012 that, well, we haven't really paid that much attention, explicit attention to, to power. So hopefully that suffices or, uh, as a general introduction to what we're doing here. What we're doing, uh, I will pause fairly soon here now and see if everyone is on board. But what we're doing here is tying together uh, what I have said to so far into two analytical dimension that we pulled, that we then uh, use to construct this two by two matrix. So on the vertical axis, um, you have the ambition to develop institutional theory conceptually. That is the normal science tradition, if you like. How ambitious are people when it comes to complying uh, with, with that normal science tradition of constantly extending and refining institutional theory conceptually? And on the horizontal axis, you have the ambition to advance research in a critical direction. And here, as I've indicated earlier, uh, we are concerned with whether there is some kind of discussion of power and whether there is some kind of critical intent behind that discussion of power. In other words, are authors interested in exploring issues of marginalization, disenfranchisement, and are they also engaging in debates about policy development, 
that aims at addressing uh, various social ills. Right, I think uh, I've been talking for a little bit longer now than I planned, but uh, this may be required a little bit of um, uh, introduction. So let's see if there's um, if there are any questions or reactions to this. There must be. <laughs> Yes, Joe Oliver, uh, you can ask. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, organizers and, and Sven for, for this talk. Uh, very briefly on your last uh, slide where you identify those two sources of power, so one more episodic and the other one more systemic, and you related this especially with cognition. Uh, maybe I'm, let's, I'm getting a little bit ahead of your discussion, but uh, especially in this area of uh, environmental uh, issues where technologies are so important. Um, does this focus on cognition when it comes to systemic forces? Is it sufficient? Uh, you also mentioned Foucault and of course, the humans, the non-humans, the technologies. Just wanted to <clears throat> ask if you think this is relevant or not. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I will probably come back to some of this later on, but I think your question, Joao, um, taps into something that is very relevant uh, at the moment in the SEA literature, uh, and which points also maybe to a limitation of our paper, because in this paper, since we're dealing with institutional theory, which is theory, which is a social theory, uh, we're only talking about political and social dimensions behind the SEA. What I think has been maybe sorely lacking in the SEA literature and which is be being rectified now, I think, by people like uh, Jan Babington and others who are really at the forefront and pushing the SEA literature in a different direction at the moment is to engage more with what we might call, broadly speaking, nature, where, you know, what you meant, you, you use the term technology, but I think what you're really referring to is nature in the broad sense. Uh, looking at how sash, so natural and social environments interact. Um, I think generally speaking, we as accounting scholars have been too preoccupied with the social and not paying enough attention to nature, broadly speaking. Uh, what Bebbington and others are doing now, um, and there have been a few papers coming out all this, on this already, is to start collaborate more with natural scientists, uh, climate scientists in particular, in order to, um, I would argue, reinvigorate this, the SEA agenda, because maybe we have become a little bit too preoccupied here with just the social uh, and political aspects and forgetting that in order to solve so-called grand challenges such as climate change, we need to take seriously the question of whether accounting actually has the capacity to improve uh, the natural state of the world as well, the, the state of the natural world and not just the social world. Uh, otherwise, we are... Uh, not going to get very far in addressing these this very burning problem of climate change or climate crisis. So, but I I acknowledge that I would argue that you know maybe if you want to do that, I don't think institutional theory perhaps is the most is the best starting point. <laughs> uh, although the, there are institutional theories like Andrew Hoffman, for instance, um, who uh, who have been trying to take you know incorporate concerns with natural environments also in also in institutional analyses, but that hasn't really sort of yet started to um, influence the accounting literature, I think. Any other questions? Tobias? Yes, yes, Tobias. yes hello, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my question would be a little bit kind of um, uh, 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 looking at the the, the y-axis, yeah. So um, accounting is kind of an applied field of study. So is it always a front and center for accounting scholars to further develop institutional theory, or mm -hmm. is it is it so to say enough when we take a nice theory from or when we borrow a theory from I don't know social sciences, uh, um, yeah, different different streams. And then explain our phenomena. So, so is it is it so to say front and center um, mm. of, of of the accounting research program to develop 
uh, like theories from from other disciplines. Yeah. Now, um, it's not the first time we got that question. <laughs> um, you know, um, what you're asking, I agree with you that, and this is what I document in my car paper from last year uh, in relationship to the management accounting literature, is that the majority of research, accounting researchers, tend to just use some kind of received version of institutional theory. They just essentially, often they just um, apply some kind of model that they find in the organization management literature to some kind of accounting problem and, and essentially stop there and do not really push the boundaries, if you like, um, by developing, trying to develop institutional theory as we as a method theory to use look and binaries terminology um, or make a more general contribution back to in, in the theories that, that, that they, you know, to the fields from where they borrow theories. And I think this is generally true of many fields of accounting research. Um, so this leads obviously to the question is, well, should we, is that fine? Is that enough? I'm not saying that you should always um, try to also make a contribution back to institutional theory as a general organizational management theory. Um, and um, if I'm being normative, as I am a little bit in my car paper, then, then yes, maybe I'm, I'm sort of saying that maybe we should be a little bit ambitious, but also try to ask ourselves, what is it that accounting has to offer as unique social phenomenon uh, that can enrich or extend, help extend institutional theory. So if you do that, you're obviously very, you're obviously relatively high up on the vertical axis here. Um, what we do in this paper is that, yes, we still use that distinction uh, for analytical purposes, the distinction about whether researchers mainly use some form of received uh, version of institutional theory or whether they're also a little bit more ambitious and try to, as I say, push the boundary in terms of extending and refining um, institutional theory in general. Uh, but we are not normative um, in this paper. We say that this can be done. Uh, it doesn't, we don't necessarily say that this should always be done, but it is a way for us to try to um, conceptualize uh, and uh, conceptualize this, ex this vertical axis. And as you will see, as I talk through the coding procedures later on, have a slightly more uh, fine grained uh, scale here for, for coding uh, for, for coding the, the vertical axis rather than just uh, treating this as a dichotomy of low versus high. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, uh, personally, uh, I think we should try to be more ambitious because um, just reading another accounting paper that uses an institution uses an institutional framework that's been you know um, pulled off pulled down from the institute from or pull, pull, pulled in from institu from institutional theory in, in org studies is in my view quite frankly boring uh, and ge very generic um, and doesn't really sort of push the boundary um, I'm not saying that personally I'm always able to do that but um, I'm trying to <laughs> that's why I'm always aspiring to where I, whether I succeed or not is another matter I was provocative. <laughs> no, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. But um, in this paper, what we're doing is um, saying that, well, we can do, you can be ambitious, you know, can be relatively high up on the vertical axis. But the question that we're really asking here, is there a trade-off between very being, very being theoretically ambitious and being critical? That's the key thing, because that's the, the key argument, as I indicated earlier, within institutional theory um, about whether we can be theoretically ambitious and critical at the same time, or whether there is some kind of inbuilt inherent conflict between these two dimensions. And I will come back to that point later. So we're using this, you know, we're using these two scales more for, it's more for analytic purposes. Anyone else? Okay, any questions about the critical dimension? Or what I mean by critical? Because this is a question that comes up often. What do you mean by critical? Um, um, and there are many different definitions of that, obviously. Um, as I've indicated, what is key to us is the question our questions of power and whether power is, is being uh, treated in, in, in a critical fashion. But that's not necessarily the only definition of being critical, obviously. Uh, other people might have uh, might have other definitions.
No? Okay. Shall I continue? All right. So before we go into the literature review, let's talk a little bit about um, about the, um, the the analytical procedures and the scope of the review. So um, we would sort of, this is not a traditional sort of systematic literature review. There is an element of that, but we're also, uh, since we're trying to uh, add a critical dimension here, also positioning this as a problematizing review. Uh, so it's a little bit of a blend of, of both. And um, it's, um, it's not a comprehensive review in the sense that we scanned everything that's out or included everything. We were a little bit selective in our, in our search procedures and the inclusion of papers in the, in the, in the review. So we, um, we followed a journal, mainly journal-driven literature search where we uh, focused on 11 um, key journals, um, which, were, which are ranked at level three and four of the UK ABS list, the Chartered Association of Business Schools Journal Ranking, which is um, one of the most well-established journal rankings, I think, in the world, certainly, certainly in Europe. Um, and um, obviously, we, re we recognize that this reduces the comprehensiveness of our sample a little bit. But on the other hand, that should be traded off against the, 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 um, the, the quality control, I guess, which is embedded in only using uh, reasonably highly ranked journals. Um, but we did also combine this journal-driven search with a database search uh, using Google Scholar and Scopus to uh, just get a feel for whether our sample was reasonably representative or not of the um, of the broader ECA literature drawing and institutional theory. And um, we think it is. Um, at least we think that we are not um, overstating our critique by uh, by not including those low, lower ranked journals. I think the paper would be even more critical if we uh, had included uh, papers in lower rank journals. Uh, so if there is anything, um, if there is any sort of bias in the paper as a result of our sampling procedures, uh, we, 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 we are on the side of caution, I think. Um, we adopted a key, keyword-based search procedure. You can see what the keywords were in the footnote in the paper. I'm not gonna go through that here. And we kept the uh, timeline relatively open. We The main search took place in February, 2023, but we didn't have an early cutoff line, but um, we didn't find anything really uh, of relevance to include in the review on, before the early 2000s. And that is really consistent with other review papers as well, saying that that's really when institutional theory started to become influential in the SEA literature. And over the last decade, as you will see shortly, it has really taken off in a big way. So we reviewed 86 papers, 86 studies. Um, and um, we mainly, for, for the analytical purposes, we mainly focused on the two dimensions that I've just outlined in our analytical framework. Uh, but we also uh, registered things like what kind of topics were being um, used, what were being researched, what kind of methodologies were being used, and so on. And we'll come back to you. I will come back to that later. Um, if um, the, if I talk a little bit about here about the uh, review procedures and the coding procedures, as I said earlier, we tried to avoid treating these two analytical dimensions as a dichotomy, but have a, at least as uh, have but have a three um, have three different di three different categories for each dimension. So if we start with the conceptual dimension, um, and this is very much based on the argument that for that that for there to be some kind of um, for there to be some kind of theoretical ambition, ambition to talk about um, in the use of institutional theory, there has to be some concern with embedded agency. This goes back to what I said earlier. These days, in 2023, if it ain't embedded, it ain't institutional. Uh, that idea of embedded agency has to be there. If that disappears or is not, is, is not explicit in the papers, uh, it doesn't really matter what else you do. Uh, then you're not likely to we coded the papers as low on the conceptual on the conceptual dimension, regardless of whether they position the research as an institutional logic study or institutional work studies study. If, if those labels are just being used, but without questions of embedded agency being taken seriously, then we still coded those studies as low. Um, the moderate for the moderate level uh, here. Um, to, be, to score moderate on that scale, the studies have to have some kind of explicit attention or of, of to of embed the problem or questions of embedded agency. 
and how that kind of agency is implicated in the reproduction and transformation of social environmental accounting practices. Uh, this, though, apply, um, implies, as Tobias was, uh, was saying earlier, that researchers typically only pick up some kind of existing institutional model uh, and a received version of institutional model and then apply that to an accounting problem, but without really having any ambition to extend or refine institutional theory in general. So we reserve that, um, that code um, for, um, for the highest, uh, highest level of this scale. So in order to score high on the conceptual dimension, there has to be some kind of attention to embedded agency, but also a relatively explicit um, striving to extend or refine institutional theory conceptually and not just apply a received version of institutional theory to a particular accounting problem. Uh, authors also have to say something about how they think they contribute to institutional theory more generally. Uh, on the critical dimension, as I said earlier, here questions of power are central. So if there were no ostensible attention to power at all, or authors talk a little bit about power or examine power without really discussing policy implications in a critical way. In other words, what are the policy implications of having analyzed power? If that is the case, then uh, we coded the studies as, as low. Uh, for that to be, for the studies to be coded as moderate, there has to be some attention to power, at least some attention to power, but also more explicit discussion around how power, concerns with power is translated are translated into critical policy implications. So we look very much for here what kind of what authors say about not just implications for the, for theory or for future research, but also implications for uh, policy and practice. But to be uh, scored, um, to be coded high on this dimension, uh, authors also have to engage quite explicitly with this debate in in organization studies about whether institutional theory can be critical or not. Um, and this is really where we sort of, if you look at the high ends of both of these scales, the conceptual development scale and the critical ambition scale, this is where you see how we uh, try to sort of understand what if there is uh, a conflict or trade-off, need for trade-off between these, uh, these two dimensions. In other words, is it possible to be highly ambitious theoretically as well as very critical at the same time and engaging with debates about institutional, whether institutional theory can be critical or not at the same time. Um, so um, each study, as is often the case, each study was coded independently by two of the authors. Um, and then we compared the codes to see if there were discrepancies. And in some cases, the third author who had not been involved in coding particular papers uh, intervened as arbiter if it was difficult to come to some kind of consensus um, right away. And um, we calculated the inter-rater um, the initial inter rate of agreement between the coders, uh, and that was about 90%, which is, I think, acceptable for um, this kind of analysis. It's slightly better than the kind of, uh, and the, than the percentage I had in my car paper last year, where we followed a, re a relatively similar coding procedure. Um, so we're quite satisfied with that. So let's look at what, what we did then was to um, divide the literature review into three, um, three groups, um, three categories that roughly follow the, the outline of institutional theory that I described earlier. So this graph shows what it looks like in the aggregate. Um, we, if you look at the blue line here, which is institutional isomorphism, that is actually the dominant, um, the dominant stream of research, which is still, maybe surprisingly, still growing. Um, and I'll explain why that is the case later on. So in this group, we found about, I think of 40 papers, which is nearly half of the half of the total sample of 86. Um, the orange line is various, represents various actor-centric studies. And here we include both um, studies of institutional entrepreneurship, strategic agency, uh, but also research on institutional work and other, other actor-centric approaches. So this is a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit more. This group is a little bit more heterogeneous, um, but we still we wanted to sort of see how this actor centric approach had grown over time. And as you can see, that is also an, an important stream of research, although it seems to be tailing off a little bit in recent years. And the re part of the reason for that is that, well, the answer to why that has tailing is maybe tailing off a bit. Um, 
you can find that the answer to that, I think, if you look at the gray curve at the bottom, which is institutional logics, which has exploded more or less over the last uh, only eight or nine years, I think, from 2015 or thereabouts. So the institutional logics perspective is the kind of new um, new, new trend here that is really uh, beginning perhaps to, to compete with institutional isomorphism. But that doesn't mean that the actor-centric approaches are completely dead. There's still, um, um, there's still um, papers coming out in that stream. So I wouldn't sort of declare that moribund, moribund quite, quite yet. Uh, this pattern, I should say, is fairly similar to what we find in other parts of the accounting literature. Um, very similar to what I found last year in my car paper on management accounting. Uh, although I had a slightly more fine-grained um, categorization of, of, of research in that paper. But it's roughly the same pattern. Uh, the difference here, obviously, is that SEA scholars have come to come quite late to the party, if you like. Um, they started using institutional theory in a big way around 2010. That's really when it started to take off, uh, while institutional research in accounting more generally goes back at least to the early, early 1980s. Um, so... And the reason for that partly is that institution, well, SEA literature up to that point was very dominated by other social theories, especially stakeholder theory and legitimacy theory. But what seems to be happening more recently is that institutional theories is, um, is um, to some extent, succeeding those, th those earlier th theories that were popular more popular earlier on. Um, if I look at the distribution of the codes across um, these three categories, um, and just look at the big picture here, yeah, uh, some of you might think that this is pretty depressing. <laughs> uh, the vast majority of the studies are down at the bottom left-hand corner, meaning that they are neither very theoretically ambitious nor very critical. Um, while on the other hand, what is quite telling here is that the upper right-hand quadrant, the upper right-hand corner is empty. There are no studies uh, that are um, that are uh, both high, that score high, both on the critical dimension and on the theoretical dimension. And apart from that, it's a little bit scattered. Uh, we see that, um, obviously, um, not surprisingly, a lot of the research following an institutional isomorphism um, approach, most of them end up in the low end, at the low end of both, both scales. They're not very ambitious theoretically because this is quite old and dated at this stage. Uh, if you just use... You know, traditional notions of institutional morph isomorphism without ad adding anything. But apart from that, it's relatively scattered. Um, there are some papers following actor-centric and institutional logic logics approaches that are a little bit more, the little bit more uh, ambitious theoretically, but there are relatively few um, studies that are explicitly critical. Uh, only six studies in total that score high on the, um, on the critical dimension here. That, in other words, what studies that explicitly engage with this broader debate about whether institutional theory can be critical or not. So uh, before I go into the underlying reasons that we highlight in the review for this pattern, uh, maybe I should just ask first if there are any uh, initial initial reactions to this pattern. Pattern Is this what you expected to see or is it uh, something that triggers thoughts in your mind? Any, any questions or reactions? Tobias, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, quick one. Um, if you look at the top five uh, journals, do you see any 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 trends there? Like, are they more towards the upper upper right corner or or? The, the sorry, the top. What do you what do you say? The top five journals. Say the top ones, like the I don't the know. The, journals. Or, yeah. yeah. Um. Well. You know, there's really only if depends on what you mean by top journal. But if you go, if you use the ABS list, there's really only one top journal that is represented in this sample, and that is AOS. Uh, we did include CAR in our sample, but we didn't find any papers actually using institutional SEA papers using institutional theory in CAR. Um, and we didn't we didn't include the other um, more positivist journals like TAR, JAR, and um, JE because they don't publish this type of work normally. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's some papers in AUS that are um, um, a little bit towards the high end, especially on the theoretical dimension. 
but not really so much on the critical dimension. Well, there's one or two maybe on the critical dimension in AOS. Um, otherwise, um, I mean, the main outlets for this work, uh, the journals that are included in our sample are obviously journals like AAAJ, which is nearly a house journal for SEA research in some ways. Um, a uh, few CPA, we actually include the Journal of Business Ethics here as well, because although that's not an accounting journal, uh, but we don't really see a clear pattern um, that is, you know, and with, there would be a correlation between journal ranking and um, how the how the how the the journals were were um, coded across those two dimensions. But having said that, that was not the main focus for us. So I mean, we haven't looked closely at that. I'm, I'm shooting a little bit from the hip here, but. Um, uh, but we could look more closely at that. But I think you would, what I said was is normal, is probably what you would find. A few others? Joao and Cameron? Yeah. Uh, very quickly. Um, could that empty cell uh, be due to the very, I would say, stringent way that you define, that you required? to classify something, uh, a paper, as having a very high critical ambition. Yeah. Because, because you say that you, you require an explicit ambition to make institutional theory critical. Now, yeah, well, well, I, no, I was well, saying we, we want to see, we were looking for whether there was an engagement with this broader debate in institutional theory about whether it can be critical or not, whether, you know, whether there were references to um, uh, Wilmot's critique, for instance, or some of the papers that have been, uh, other papers like Cooper et al., for instance, who was one of the earliest book choppers, papers book chop really, uh, but where Wilmot was also involved. Um, uh, that that's what we were looking for, um, and whether or whether there was some kind of other tangential engagement with similar debates, or whether the critical dimension was more or less um, was perhaps a little bit more implicit. If you only kept the first condition to be uh, ample attention to power. Yeah. If, if you only kept that and dropped the explicit ambition to make institutional theory critical, yeah, would you think that you would have more papers? Being uh, no, I mean those 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 two issues are very closely intertwined because this critical debate around this debate about, about around whether institutional theory can be critical or not has largely been a debate about whether it has paid attention to power or not, or whether it has become very sort of conservative or political and politically anodyne. Okay. So I think um, that's I think it's helpful I think to have that slightly more fine grained scale. Um, obviously, we are setting the bar relatively high here um, for both dimensions for what papers need to do in order to score high. But I think that's helpful in order to in order to avoid treating this as a dichotomy, you know, just high versus low. Cameron, Sven? yeah, hey, nice to see you, Sven. You too, Cameron. Um, so I'm I'm looking at this uh, three by three, which is uh, I I'll, I'll say is a nice improvement over a two by two. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, now the fact that there's nothing in the top right corner, um, I wonder if that's related to the 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 difficulty it is to get really groundbreaking papers published. Mm. You know, the, the, there there seems to be something in our editorial and review process that shrinks ambition and looks for incremental contributions rather than groundbreaking contributions to the literature. It's a kind of a safety first approach. Yeah. So if that's true, um, why do you think that there's a little more openness to an incremental improvement on the uh, the lower scale on the on the critical direction? than um, on the vertical scale. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, this it's a, it's a very good point. And um, I think it's also a point that has been made before uh, on this paper and other contexts, you know, um, about whether this is, um, you know, whether authors engage in some kind of, or, you know, self-disciplining uh, process when either when they write the papers or whether they are, or whether the critical aspects are getting flushed out uh, in the review process or in the editorial process, even mm -hmm. um, we don't, um, we can't really answer that question, obviously, without actually talking to authors and asking, you know, com complementing this kind of study with interviews, in-depth interviews, 
but we try to um, uh, get under the skin, if you like, of, of people. But uh, that would make for a fascinating study to sure. interview authors about their experiences in the review process in with respect to their ambition for the yeah. paper. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, um, you would hope that that's not the case if you're talking about journals like CPA and perhaps even Triple AJ, right? But yeah. <laughs> but yeah. uh, there's no guarantee, obviously, that people, you know, are a bit conservative even in those types of publication outlets. Yeah. Um, we don't know. Um, we can we can we can have our hunches and guesses, but um, we don't know whether this is um, what I mean. What we're doing, we're using maybe maybe a little bit sloppily. We're using this notion of critical intent. The question yeah. that, that arises is whose intent is that? Is it the intent of the authors, <laughs> or is it the intent of the scholarly community that we are part of? You know, if that's a, that's uh, an empirical question. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and. Um, I mean, we are tapping in, into into recent debates in CPA, obviously, very recent debate papers in press now. This paper by Begoni and um, Mohammed, I think it's called, um, I think, where um, wh wh who are raising this issue and a number of, of other commentaries in that paper, which, again, is, um, again, I, I suppose within the critical accounting uh, research community, some type of attempt to get... Uh, to to um, to reflect a little bit on these issues, mm -hmm. but um, but you know this is a debate that seems to be coming back with regular intervals, and I'm wondering if this going around a little bit in circles at the moment. It could be, um, yeah. You know, so um, personally, I can only sort of I can I can self declare where I stand personally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a middle of the road Swedish social democrat, extremely <laughs> pragmatic. <laughs> yeah. You know, although yeah. although I have been radicalized over the last fifteen years when I've been working in the UK, um, I was not particularly interested in critical re accounting research before I moved to the UK. But that's, uh, made, I think that's a combination of factor of working in a different context, uh, but also getting old, maybe. <laughs> so I don't. Know. <laughs> but yeah. I think I think it's obviously I I think it's important to be reflexive about those issues, being self reflexive, mm -hmm. obviously, but also sometimes. Um, try to um, uh, engage in reflections about how we operate as editors and reviewers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but well, I think this paper is a nice contribution to that. And I, I really like the fact that you're you're trying to categorize, you're trying to think about what you're seeing rather than simply summarizing themes, which we see in so much of the kind of review literature, mm. review papers. So nice work. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else? Okay, but as I said, before we go into literature, what we, as I said earlier, what we tried to do when we analyzed the papers was not to prejudge this whole um, issue of whether institutional theory can be critical, whether it should be critical or not. Uh, we tried to, um, um, to, to keep a relatively open mind and be agnostic about that, and then look, uh, read the papers closely and look at what, um, what the authors are really trying to do um, in respect, with respect to these two analytical dimensions, rather than having a fixed idea a priori about whether institutional theory can be critical or not. I will come back a little bit to this um, uh, when I conclude the paper, conclude the discussion, I think, when I, and when I talk about possible ways forward. But let's look first at the um, underlying reasons for the pattern that I've just, uh, that we've just seen. Um, and I think that's um, uh, that, that's um, that's a um, um, I, I will talk about this separately in relationship to the two analytical dimensions. So I'm starting here with the reasons that we that we see for why we think papers score relatively low uh, in the in, in in general on the theoretical on the theory, on the vertical axis, the theoretical dimension. Uh, and what we see, especially in the large group of research talking about inst using notions of institutional isomorphism is that um, is many SEA researchers have essentially stopped there uh, by saying, and nearly seem to think that institutional theory is more or less, uh, cannot more or less be equated with Imaggio and Paolo Mayer or maybe Scott's pillars from 95 uh, at best. 
And the reason for one, one reason for that, one important reason for that, I think, is that is, SEA scholars are still very much stuck in this debate that started over 15 years ago now, that institutional theory could be some type of alternative or complement to legitimacy theory or uh, stakeholder theory. Um, and if you start from there and just say that, well, institutional theory has something to add uh, to those two dimensions, to those two theories, uh, you only you only really end up with the conclusion that it's important to take broader societal forces into account, societal value systems and so forth, and how they diffuse. And to do that, if you, that is as far as you want to go, if that, you don't want to stretch the argument any further than that, yeah, I mean, you tend to stop with institutional isomorphism. Uh, and there's also a similar trend to use just use institutional isomorphism uh, in combination with other theories, uh, often more positivist functionalist theories like economic theories, even contingency theory or uh, various other strategic management theories. So where authors just adopt some kind of theory juxtaposition approach and sometimes horse race institutional theory against competing theories. Um, and against that, again, that and uh, you and authors that way end up with a very sort of, I would argue, dated and relatively simplistic uh, understanding of what institutional theory is or where it stands today. Um, and that's why they don't score very high on the on, on the theoretical uh, on the theoretical dimension. But um, there are also other explanations um, because. Uh, the vast, a vast number of studies um, that fall into, especially the isomorphism category, are disclosure studies, um, often based on methodologies that are not very conducive to talking about agency or studying human agency in, in, in any greater depth. Uh, they're not, um, you know, so they're either archival studies or qualitative content analyses or. Uh, cross-sectional field studies or case studies, but where there's not a strong process dimension. And I, I would argue that in order to understand embedded agency and understand institutional change from that kind of perspective, we need to have a much stronger longitudinal and process-oriented perspective. Uh, and that's not the case. So that's a methodological issue, which I think to some extent is very closely intertwined with the choice of research topics and the choice of, of research questions, which are very much around what is it that drives social and environmental disclosures. So the focus here is very much on what, how do individual organizations react, if you like, uh, to either strategically or in other ways, to institutional pressures that come from outside and are largely given. And with authors are not really engaging with um, questions about how those institutional pressures uh, come about or how they evolve, come about in the first place and how they evolve. So there's very little emphasis here on history, if you like, or, or very little emphasis on the macro level processes involved in shaping what we call institutions uh, at, at the field level. So very much a sort of outside in perspective on organizations rather than more of an inside out or macro level perspective that looks at institutional processes from a um, from more dynamic field perspective. Um, and also, insofar as people actually recognize the criticism of these early strands of institutional theory centered on isomorphism and start incorporating notions of agency, human agency, they often stop, um, well, they often stop short of uh, recognizing notions of institutional entrepreneurship or maybe Christine Oliver's work, which is quite, um, quite widely used, which only looks at agency is a relatively strategic uh, phenomenon, strategic responses to institutional pressures that come from outside. What do, how do organizations behave strategically when they respond to different uh, institutional pressures? Uh, and that kind of approach that emerged in the late 80s, late 90s, as we already seen, has been quite roundly criticized by authors who uh, emphasize embedded agency and similar approaches. So again, that's another reason for why some of the act, many of the actor-centric studies uh, do not really score very highly, even though they have moved beyond on the theoretical dimension, even though they have moved beyond uh, basic notions of institutional isomorphism. Um, insofar as more contemporary approaches like institutional work and institutional logics have been applied, uh, if we start with the logics perspective, there are many studies that simply use institutional logics as some kind of analytical archetype uh, and hence fall victim to what 
Lance Baridol have recently called a toolkit approach to institutional logics, which again becomes very sort of deductive and mechanistic, uh, not very different actually from research that studies isomorphism, institutional isomorphism that just replaced notions of isomorphism with certain given uh, institutional logics that are either directly derived from Thornton and all topology, where you have seven different institutional logics to choose from, or from uh, prior research in similar contexts, but where there's very little emphasis on how agents actually engage with institutional logics and how institutional logics are translated into practice. Uh, and again, this is, a, I think, a little bit of a methodological artifact that is due to the fact that not all, very relatively few studies using the institutional logics perspective have been process oriented. They're relatively static, uh, course, um, often based on uh, uh, cross-sectional field studies and similar approaches. So less use of quantitative methods, but again, without really sort of engaging in the deep kind of ethnographic research that I think we need to uh, engage with if you truly want to understand how institutional logics are translated um, into practice or how and how logics are enacted, reproduced, and transformed, as I say. Um, and there are a few in the few studies that use the institutional work perspective, uh, there is also, again, a tendency to um, just use existing notions of institutional work as some kind of sorting mechanism, but without really digging deeply into um, questions of embedded agency. Um, so those are the reasons for why um, why um, most studies score relatively low or at best moderate uh, on the theoretical uh, dimension, the, the vertical axis. Uh, I should say here that it's not pitch black. <laughs> Situation here, this picture is not pitch black here. There are good examples, which we do highlight in the paper. Uh, some of Brendan McGuire's recent work, for instance, um, is not sort of, is, is, is standing out very much, I think, here. Uh, theoretically, where he has started to engage more with broader debates and critical debates around institutional theory, and a number of other authors, um, uh, Massimo Contrafatto, for instance, and, 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 and a few others. But this is the general pattern. If we, if I look, if we look at the other dimension here, what, um, and the reasons for the limited, um, limited efforts to be critical, um, then we can see that, um, well, in a lot of papers, there is some kind of discussion, especially towards the back end and the concluding parts, about implications for policy. Um, um, and a lot of that, those discussions typically tend to be, um, revol tend to revolve around the idea that a criticism of the fact that SEA uh, disclosures, in particular reporting, has in most contexts so far been uh, voluntary. It's only very recently that we've seen more uh, mandatory forms of regulation being brought in and um, disclosures being made made mandatory. We see that in the European Union, for instance, um, and, and in other contexts. But this is a relatively recent phenomenon where SEA disclosures are being regulated more strongly. So what authors often call for is more or better regulation of SEA, um, of SEA disclosures in particular and reporting in order maybe to avoid some of the tendencies towards decoupling or greenwashing or window dressing. That is, that have been widely documented in the SEA literature, not just in research building and institutional theory. Um, but often that kind of discussion of policy implications is not grounded in a thorough understanding of how policy uh, implications of policy development is related to power. Questions of power are sometimes brought, being brought to the fore, um, but often power is then treated as a very static concept. It's treated as something that belongs uh, to, to individual actors. So the argument often in disclosure literature is that, well, disclosures are, are emphasizing different aspects because different stakeholders or institutional constituencies have different, different amounts or different degrees of power but the power differentials between different actors are not problematized, but essentially treated as a given phenomenon. So I guess this is a way of trying to infer, work backwards and inferring from empirical findings what kind of um, power relations might lie behind uh, the particular disclosure, disclosure patterns. But 
very rarely are critical questions asked about how those power relations, power relations might change over time, how those power relations create winners and losers, and what we can do more normatively about um, um, in social ills that emerge from uh, from regulation working in a particular way or not working in a particular way, from power relations being sh shaped in a particular way. So we argue here that in order to understand and be more critical, we need a more dynamic um, attention, to, uh, dy dynamic um, and relational perspective on power. Um, but that, on the other hand, mustn't flip over um, so that actor becomes a, a completely actor centric. So the power becomes a, something that is completely actor centric, um, um, and where the tendency would be to just emphasize episodic power, because that means that you're sort of falling back to this very this to what was roundly criticized earlier on in the institutional theory about uh, strategic agency being brought back in in an in an excessive or or uh, exaggerated way in institutional theory as a as a as a reaction against earlier versions of um, uh, early versions of institutional theory that tend to be too deterministic, if you like. So what we argue here in the paper is that we need to have a um, in order to there are rel relatively few papers that have a reasonably balanced emphasis on what we call episodic and systemic power. Systemic power, perhaps not surprisingly, is very rarely brought to the fore because, as I said earlier, it's something that is much more difficult to talk about theoretically and conceptually, and um, and and it's often not empirically observable, perhaps not easily observable empirically, because we need to understand uh, in order. Um, in order to talk in an intelligent fashion about systemic power, we need to understand how institutions uh, are internalized by various social actors, how they are influencing deeper socio-cognitive processes. And this kind of work is, is very challenging to do. Um, but this is important from the point of view of um, trying to be critical, but also theoretically ambitious at the same time, because we believe that if there isn't a strong, a reasonably balanced emphasis on episodic and systemic power. Uh, notions of embedded agency will be will disappear. Will dis disappear like baby with a bathwater. Really, be flushed out with like babies with a bathwater. Um, so we don't necessarily think here that there is a, a, a conflict, an inbuilt conflict between the critical and theoretical dimensions. Although it may appear that way from uh, from the from the three by three matrix that I presented earlier when I presented the coding. Um, so, um, and we also argue here that um, insofar as questions of power have been concerned, they haven't been really sort of tied in with broader questions about how broader macro level, field level dynamics operating at the macro level, how they change and evolve over time. Um, and that, we see very few references, for instance, or any references at all to this emerging debate in, in org studies about societal grand challenges, which is all about trying to take fields perspective, the field perspective more seriously and bring in um, uh, questions about macro level processes uh, and multi-level processes, perhaps uh, cutting across different levels of institutional fields and even within organizations. Um, so, um, that's where we stand here. I'm already hinting at um, some of the ways that institutional theory can be made more critical, but also quite ambitious theoretically at the same time. But it requires us to um, to combine a relatively dynamic and relational view of um, of power, um, but still combining that, uh, but without, I should say falling into the trap of become of adopting a very actor-centric approach to power that only emphasizes episodic power, but have a more balanced approach that emphasizes both the episodic and systemic dimensions of, of power. Uh, otherwise, um, this is not going to be particularly institutionalist. It would be probably be more similar to an actor network theory study. Um, so, um, those are the um, the key points I think that I've gone through now um, that emerge from the literature review. Um, so before I wrap things up here, maybe I should um, open up for questions again. Comments? Auntie. 
Hello, Sven. Nice to see you and uh, excellent, excellent. Uh, you paper. too, my Finnish friend. Thank you. <laughs> an ex excellent paper, and it's it's obviously important to be critical and consider the uh, conceptual accuracy. However, I might assume that at least in the let's say 10, 15 years ago, many papers have focused totally on the substance of accounting and changes. Perhaps even reviewers have not been very familiar with the uh, institutional theory, latest developments. So there may be uh, reasons that the focus has been totally in the, in the practice and then that reviewers might have wanted mm -hmm. to limit the, uh, uh, let's say, the critical aspects or conceptual ambition if there has been which I basically doubt, but there might have been some mm. slight reasons additionally to those that you mentioned for the limited. Can, uh, can I maybe, well, I think you're asking me and maybe if I reframe this uh, slightly more provocatively. Uh, are you asking me, are you ask? is the question here whether the accounting research community is too poorly educated when it comes to institutional theory? Is that the question? No, no, not not really. I mean that uh, mm. it's not always mandatory to be very critical or mm. very ambitious in in terms of conceptual uh, development. So uh, let's say at least in the early years, mm. that's that's just my point to mm. consider the yeah, reason. I, I don't know. I mean, I think it, tap, it, it taps into a little. It's. Um... I think your question is a little bit tangential, perhaps to I think the question that was Cameron, or maybe no Tobias, I think, asked yeah. earlier, or maybe both of them. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, I can. Um, I can only speak for myself, really, yeah. and, and the reviews that I get when it comes to. Uh, when I use institutional theory, or review a paper that uh, is based on institutional theory. Personally, yeah, I probably tend to set the bar quite high, but that's because I've become obsessed with all these things, and I've been using institutional theory for nearly twenty-five years now. Um, and maybe was um, fortunate in the sense of jumping on this bandwagon of, at a very early stage. Yeah, and, um, and I've tried to get off that bandwagon on various occasions, but find it very difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, beginning to feel a little bit, little bit like, um, is it? Al Pacino in The Godfather 3, you know, just when I thought I was getting out, they pulled me straight back in. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are still standing. You are still standing. Yeah, but I'm also uh, that's, that's a different movie. I'm also a critical realist, remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm, no, I've, been, I've been trying from time to time to nearly give up on institutional theory, but it's hard. And it's hard, obviously, because it is the new mainstream. Um, it's certainly in the new mainstream in management and organization studies where you can hardly do anything without relating it in some fashion to institutional theory. And mm -hmm. sometimes I have the feeling that um, the accounting literature is becoming a bit like that as well, especially the management accounting literature, but maybe a little bit less so now than, say, uh, five, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but, you quite, but that doesn't really answer, the, answer your question. You, the question is... Um, um, what is being required, if you like, to get a paper published by way of theoretical ambition, I think, in particular. Yeah. And, yeah, maybe that is not so low, and maybe that says a lot about where we stand as an account, as a research community in accounting. Um, but in my view, um, that makes institutional research very boring and generic. You know, why should I read a paper, an accounting paper, that is just doing exactly the same thing that has been done many, many times before in org studies? <laughs> True, true. Yeah, it's the historical development, exactly. Yes, and yeah. so, uh, so my 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 argument is, I think we should try to be more ambitious. To yeah, be honest. yeah. Nowadays, at least, yeah, yeah, exactly. Good, uh, Ahmed. Yeah, Ahmed. Yeah. Um. Thanks for uh, the interesting uh, paper. Actually, um, uh, this is Ahmed Abras, University of Sheffield. 
Um, actually, I uh, published a couple of paper last year about, uh, and I used the institutional theorization in the field of uh, Islamic financial reporting standardization, those projects that aim to develop some standards for Islamic banking. And uh, I talked about the power dynamic in these uh, in this field um, using institu uh, institutional logics and institutional entrepreneurship. Actually, the, addressing power using institutional theorization is is very interesting, and I, I enjoyed it. But uh, during the reviewing process, during the revision process, uh, especially when I talk about the paper that was published in AAAJ, we were asked to use some supplementary theory in order to address the issue of power. And the reviewer, I remember, he suggested Focal to, to, to address the issue of power. Mm -hmm. We didn't use Focal, we used Purdue instead. Uh, we use the, the issue or the, the concept of power as capital in, in, uh, in a field. Um, so what do you think about this kind of theoretical triangulation? Like, do we need or is it good to use such kind of theoretical triangulation in order to enhance the potential of institutional theory to address the issue of power and to be more critical? What do you think about this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm obviously a um, an advocate, not always, but I have nothing um, against um, and you know triangulation is something is a topic I've written about in other contexts, but um, there has to be a purpose behind it. Uh, it's not a it's not the be all and end all of it, um, and maybe the co concern I have sometimes when um, authors are being encouraged or pushed to um, incorporate other theories or theorize things different from, from differently from the way that they were theorized initially is that um, uh, people engage in theorizing for the sake of theorizing uh, without really asking themselves what is it that they're trying to to accomplish so if you just take the great thinkers that you just mentioned I mean obviously institutional theory has a huge intellectual depth to Bourdieu which for a long period of time went unrecognized, um, not least Imagine Powell. The whole field concept comes from Bourdieu. Um, and there are interesting anecdotes around the Dimaggio Powell paper how, about how the Bourdieusian influence um, disappeared in the review process. Uh, I've heard anecdotes saying that in the working paper, working paper version of that paper, there were, there were many more references to Bourdieu. In the published version, you don't see any references to Bourdieu. Uh, I'm not sure why that happened. When it comes to Foucault, yeah, the, that's really where the tensions are beginning to to um, um, to emerge. I think people like Hugh Wilmot and others who are critical of institutional theories for trying to become an inst theory, for trying to become a theory of everything, if you like, are particularly critical of the way that institutional theorists have tried to incorporate ideas from Foucault. Um, but they are influential, I think, especially when it comes to this idea of systemic power particular types of systemic power. One type of systemic power is discipline in Lawrence's framework. And that's a very Foucauldian idea that works at the sort of works through discourse and works through um, the sociocognitive level. Um, but um, but I'm not saying that that can't be done, but uh, there has, be, has to be some kind of well-defined purpose behind that triangulation and also be, be wary of, um, uh, of what you incorporate and whether things are ontologically and epistemologically uh, 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 compatible. So in, in, in your, uh, another question maybe, uh, in your uh, um, review, have you like seen this kind of triangulation as a common theme or? Uh, yeah, I mean, a... that's not, it wasn't one of our key questions really, but I think it comes, we didn't look specifically what you might call triangulation. But there, there are elements of that, obviously. If you look at this tendency to um, use institutional theory as a complement to other theories or horse race it with other theories, yeah, that's a form of triangulation, you could argue. Um, but it doesn't, in our, in our analysis, that doesn't make the, um, make the use of institutional theory very, very sophisticated in a conceptual sense. Uh, if you, um, 
And also, although there are some other papers, obviously, that combine institutional theory with other social theories, like social movement theory, for instance, uh, in order to make it more, uh, to add, if you like, conceptually to, um, to, uh, to institutional theory. But if you just use institutional theory as a complement to something else, of course, race it against something else, you're not really adding anything conceptually. You're just trying to figure out which theory wins or loses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Muhammad? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sven. Uh, I hope my question doesn't come out of place. Um, I think I suspect I'm the youngest on the call. I'm a third year undergrad student uh, in Jordan. And uh, I've been really taken away post studying counting theory as a course with theoretical research. And I stumbled upon your critical reality uh, paper in accounting. And it has, um, it has, inspired within me the idea that more research could be done in terms of uh, theoretical foundations of accounting more than quantitative or qualitative research that's most common from the country I'm currently from. And I was kindly wondering if you could kindly advise um, how could somebody in this level pursue more um, or how they should they direct their foundations in contributing towards theoretical foundation of accounting in terms of um, the ontology of epistemology or the critical reality that we utilize accounting in, in interpreting reality or the social structure of reality around us. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I think you're asking a very, very broad question there, which goes way beyond this paper. Um, I'm not quite <laughs> sure how to answer, to be honest. Uh, uh, so um, what was the question again? The question is how, how should um, aspiring people, aspiring researchers, direct All right. their. Okay. Where should you start? How, how ambitious should you be uh, when you set out with your um, PhD project or whatever? Well, I think you should be quite ambitious. Why not? Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, your research will just be boring. Yeah, I, I think I think it's it's a bit courageous to um, maybe go into the identification of the ontology or epistemology of accounting of how yeah. they construct or reflect reflect reality and i was just wondering because i'm considering try this in my undergrad thesis on how should i pursue yeah, I mean, this we don't we don't go into a lot of debate around ontology and epistemology in this paper um uh you know if if you're interested in reading up on that um there are other papers maybe that are much better in terms of looking at what the ontological and epistemological tensions are when it comes to what we are talking about here. There is obviously a little bit of emphasis on this epistemological dimension, which we, what we're picking up here on here is whether there is a conflict or uh, or not between these two dimensions that we're looking at. That's that's an epistemological question is, but but we don't go into a lot of depth about the ontological foundations of, um, uh, of institutional theory and how that mm -hmm. impacts whether research can be critical. I think personally, I think whether research can be critical or not is not an ontological question. It's an epistemological question. It's a question about what kind of, uh, you know, the values and um, uh, and, and governance structures that that uh, uh, condition the way we do research and how we pub where we publish and what we publish. But um, it goes a little bit beyond this paper, so maybe. Okay, that's quick enough. All right, thank you so much. Aziza. Aziza. Hi, Sven. Hi. Happy to see you. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. I I jumped in the, the presentation. I'm sorry I was late. So um, I, I, I had a question regarding all this uh, element of analysis, I was wondering how this would differ from a, a more conventional accounting literature. Do you think that, is there any specific element due to SEA, or do you think it's a more general trend? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, in the SEA community, there has been uh, a long debate really about uh, I think this is captured primarily, especially by um, Brendan and Jeffrey's piece in AOS in 2016, where they play with this um, uh, two concepts of passion versus rigor. 
And the argument is that the SEA community in particular has been has been a lot of passion. You know, there's been a lot of passion and for the for the for the for the for the, for the particular issues that they're concerned with. Um, social and environmental crises and um, disenfranchisement and marginalization and so on, and increasingly big issues like climate change and so on. Uh, but what that has sort of overshadowed uh, people's theoretical ambition and what people have been maybe in some respects quite atheoretical, at least earlier, but you get you don't get anything published now, at least these days without having some kind of theory and theoretical ambition. So they sort of Go around shopping for a particular theory and have now recently found institutional theory as something that is potentially useful um, to package their arguments but where the emphasis is not really on scoring very high on the theoretical the, the theoretical dimension the sea community that is uh, something that is perhaps a little bit specific to the sea community and uh, where well, there has been some hand wringing around that uh, within the community but um and that's also very much what what spence and all are a bit yeah, nearly ridiculing to some extent, and calling the uh, calling the uh, this a big big angst fest and that sort of thing. And we don't want to use that kind of language because we we don't want to be too polemic in this paper. Uh, so that's those are their words. But I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure if this is more something that's more um, uh, you know prevalent in the, uh, in the in the broader interdisciplinary critical accounting community. Uh, Okay. Thank you. Maybe we should just wrap up here. I think we're um, I'm not sure we're set with time or how flexible you are there, Mohammed. But uh, 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 you know, I, I if I'm to conclude here and going back to where we started this paper, uh, we essentially started with two not competing explanations, but um, complete you know alternative perspectives that partly overlapped, I guess. And so one question we asked is was whether um, SEA scholars have kept up with institutional theory um, conceptually uh, and um, and whether they have been critical and whether this is um, uh, or whether they have sort of as many other as or as institutional theorists in general gone overboard with uh, with theorizing and being uh, and ignoring critique. Um, and the overriding observation here is that the research that we're reviewing is neither very ambitious theoretically nor very critical. Uh, but we're leaning more towards the um, explanation, the kind of explanation that Spence et al. provide, and that is that SEA scholars have, as I said earlier, come late to the party, been quite late, relatively speaking, even compared to other accounting uh, fields of accounting research, in adopting institutional theory as a popular theory in, in related cognitive fields of research without really thinking very much about how can we take this forward theoretically, but also not really thinking about how can institutional theory help make the research agenda more critical. So that is quite similar to the kind of argument that Spencer all promoted. We don't find any strong evidence perhaps that there is an inbuilt conflict that the lack of critique, if you like, lack of critical intent is due to some kind of inbuilt conflict between theoretical ambitious ambition and uh, and critical ambition. If that was the case, um, the coding would look quite different. Um, so even if you don't find any papers in the upper right-hand corner in the three by three matrix that we had earlier, that is not necessarily uh, an indication that the lack of critique is due to um, uh, very high theoretical ambition. Um, but we don't want to sort of declare this uh, kind of research a dead end. We think there are a number of ways in which you can be um, move up the scales on both dimensions. Um, obviously, if this pattern continues and people are just complying and just using received versions of institutional theory, but without thinking about how it can may be made more critical, then we're not going to see much progress or improvement here. But as I think I've already hinted at, I think that there are opportunities here to engage with questions of power um, and engage critically with, with, with the notion of power by asking questions about who are the winners and losers uh, when it comes to how power relations are constructed, but how can those power relations also be transformed so that very social ills um, and big societal problems are, are rectified in some fashion. Um, but in order to do that and also be theoretically ambitious at the same time, we need to tie this in with the kind of conceptualizations 
that it, of power that have started to emerge in institutional theory, which treat power as a dynamic and relational phenomenon, but at the same time recognizes the potentially constraining effect of institutional embeddedness. And in order to do that, we need to pay have a balanced emphasis on both episodic and systemic power, um, and um, but also a dynamic perspective to how actors con continuously sort of switch between um, exercising episodic power and being constrained by various uh, modes of systemic power, uh, and how that shapes, that interplay between episodic and systemic power shapes the evolution of power relations over time. Is only there by doing that and tying that in with the discussion of uh, relevant policy implications that we can be theoretically ambitious and perhaps a little bit more critical at the same time, um, and always keeping this question of uh, at the front of our head, front of our minds of who are the winners and losers at the moment, and how can we rectify and make uh, rectify the relationships between so-called winners and losers in institutional environments and make the world a better place, hopefully. Um, in order to do that, I think we need to uh, move away from this dominant emphasis on how in individual organizations react to given institutional pressures. We need to engage more with field level dynamics. We need to move beyond individual organizations and become a little bit more macro oriented. Perhaps if you're really ambitious, uh, nurture longitudinal multi-level analyses that look at the recursive relationships uh, power relationships, that re relations that evolve between fields and individual organizations. Um, this is obviously very, uh, a very demanding type of research to do. It requires um, uh, long periods of time. You can do this maybe some, to some extent by looking historically, but if you also want to engage with current uh, policy debates and policy issues, you need to also do this in real time. And that requires a long, uh, um, you know, um, you know, it requires us to engage deeply with the field over relatively long periods of time. And we all know that in the publish and perish environment that we all live, uh, it's not necessarily all that conducive to this type of research. So, um, but that's a topic for another paper, another discussion, I think. Um, and looking at um, the institutional dynamics, both behind and around uh, SEA practices, uh, and looking at what I sometimes say, call the institutional effects on accounting, but also the institutional effects of accounting and the more, shall we call it, the constitutive or performative effects of accounting. However, I should round this off by saying, by, you know, um, by adding a caveat here. And that is that if you talk about critique, as I say, if there are any raving Marxists out there, this is probably not for you. Um, you have to be, as myself, perhaps, you know, as I indicated earlier, a little bit of, of a pragmatist, middle of the road uh, person when it comes to expecting, having reasonable and realistic expect expectations for what kind of critique institutional theory can, can provide. Uh, it will be kind of critique that is always contingent, very contextualized. It has to be understood in its uh, natural institutional environment. Um, and also if there's something that's been documented in institutional theory is that institutions tend to be long lived creates significant amounts of inertia, which means that overly radical change can perhaps not be be, be accomplished or hoped for. Uh, so it's not a sort of grand theory, if you like, such as more traditional Marxist thought that prescribe universal solutions to environmental and social problems. This has to be you know, quite grounded and, um, and situated in the specific institutional environments where accounting operates. So I think that I'll, I'll end on that note. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor Seven, for your contribution and your effort. It's really an excellent presentation and excellent paper. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone joining us today. And uh, thank you very much, dear Professor uh, Steven Model, for taking the time to present it to us. It's been really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present the paper. And uh, thank you for, for all of you to bear with me on this Friday afternoon. Yeah. And I hope to see you soon in Egypt. You are very, very welcome, dear Brussels 7. Thank you.